Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob and I am the uh, one of the two extension specialists here at the University of Kentucky. As part of my job, I organize the monthly webinars for e-extension, small and backyard um, poultry flocks. And for this month's um, webinar, we're going to be looking at composting for the small and backyard flocks. And our presenter will be Greg Martin from Penn State University. I will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. If you have a question, um, just type it in the chat box or the Q&A. If the question is pertinent to what he is talking about at that time, I will uh, come unmuted. My video will come back up and I will ask the question. Otherwise, the questions will be held to the end. So all yours, Greg, and I will be on mute and no video until a question. Okay, so she'll she'll pop in when we have questions. So there is a Q and A box below uh, or above, depending on which way Zoom is presenting to you. Uh, please go ahead and enter your questions at any time that they that they form. That won't interrupt us a bit, and we'll be able to uh, take those questions in order. In addition to those that were submitted earlier, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am a, a poultry educator by trade. Uh, I've been working with poultry since 1976. And so I've handled flocks of 50 as well as flocks of 5 million. And so uh, there's a lot of issues that are related to both sizes of flocks. And one of those is how do we handle manure efficiently so that we do not cause a problem with, with smells uh, flies and other issues concerning manure and other composting um, issues that you may have. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, manure and composting and how they can be related for a good outcome. So, you know, there is, uh, whenever we have livestock, we have byproducts. And one of the largest byproducts that we have to deal with is certainly manure. Sometimes if we think about it also, we can consider uh, bedding and litter as a byproduct as well that we have to contend with, especially if we talk about cattle and straw pack um, issues. Sometimes those become a, a, a composting issue as well. But for the most part, uh, for poultry, it is litter uh, that is used to absorb the, the water out of the manure that's being deposited by the birds. And that at times can create ammonia smells. It can create dust if it gets too dry. It can create neighbor issues, especially if you have heavy infestations of flies within your, your pens. It could possibly, especially if it's a, a moisture issue, it can cause diseases to spread uh, within the flocks and across flocks within your area. And then the idea of logistics, how do we handle it in a proper and efficient manner so it doesn't become a, a bothersome chore? And so we're going to talk a little bit about each of these as we go through uh, today's discussion. So, you know, with poultry, uh, we usually mix our bedding and our manure together. Uh, the litter acts as a uh, non-stick surface for, for poultry droppings. And it also acts as a uh, sponge to absorb moisture. Because if you think about it, for every pound of feed that a chicken eats, every pound, there's usually two pounds of water consumed. And so that water is voided in two ways. One is through the respiratory system of the bird as they're giving off metabolic uh, moisture, as well as moisture that's voided out in the feces, out the back of the bird. And so when this material is voided, it's around 60% moisture. And we use litter to help dry off the manure uh, so that it, it becomes more or less encapsulated. If, um, you know, um, if, uh, if it's allowed to stay wet though, it can cause a lot of odor and a lot of pests. And so uh, especially manure, as you can see here in this picture that's left out in the open, 
because of the high carbon content of the litter, sometimes that can absorb large amounts of water, making it incredibly hard to dry. And so uh, we need to make sure we handle our litter and our manure properly so that it doesn't become an issue. So a little bit of an ounce of prevention uh, saves a pound of cure if we wanna talk about uh, acronyms there. So um, I've seen a lot of different pests uh, invade manure, everything from litter beetles to darkling beetles to flies, as well as uh, other pests, uh, forward flies, for example. And so um, it can be a harborage for a lot of different pests. And so having dry manure and manure that's handled properly avoids a lot of these issues and a lot of headaches. So outdoor housing uh, is typically where we're keeping our birds. Not very many people I know are keeping birds inside their houses and simply because of this idea that the birds have to have a place to go to the bathroom. So it's important that we make sure uh, that, uh, you know, we have um, housing that's set up for manure um, handling. And so, uh, for example, this structure here is actually one that is has plans posted at the University of Kentucky. I think it's a great uh, design simply because it uses materials that most people can get their hands on. And if you look at these three designs here, they're actually mobile designs. We call these chicken tractors where you can drop the wheels down and move it along or in a skid type uh, arrangement where you just drag this along. This allows uh, fresh, bed, uh, fresh ground to be moved underneath the birds, allowing for a new area to absorb moisture. And so proper planning for these uh, structures is important, especially when we consider, um, uh, when we consider, I gotta hide the video panel, hang on a minute. Okay, there we go. So the, the way we uh, handle these things is that we move them around the area and that way we have fresh areas for the deposition of manure. Static sheds like we have here have to have designs so that you can collect and or get in to clean these things or else you'll end up with muddy areas and uh, pests that will come in, both rodents and flies. Uh, that are looking to scavenge off the manure that might be deposited in here. So as you can see with this type of structure, there is a drawer here that you can pull out to help um, empty the droppings off of this closed in area, but certainly there isn't any accommodation here uh, in the pen for cleaning unless you go through the door here uh, and, and actually scoop out the uh, pen. So it's important to think about design as you're figuring out what to do with the manure. So the most common buildings that I see are what we call shed type housing. And that's a simple slat, uh, slanted roof. And this has windows for allowing air to get into and an access door that's large enough for a person to get into. When you have designs such as this that just has a chicken door, uh, there has to be allowances to where you can get in there and clean out that, that uh, coop. Uh, this appendage here on the left is a, a nest box. And typically you wanna keep the nest boxes as dry as possible. So typically what we have is folks will keep a different litter source in the main living quarters uh, that is different from what the nest box is. So we may have AstroTurf in the nest box. We may have uh, softwood or hardwood shavings in the coop. So keeping them different allows the chicken to know that they're in the nest box and they won't foul the nests. So nest boxes can be anything you can imagine. Uh, these are modified buckets with the lids that are glued into place to allow the litter to stay in place. Um, this here is what I would call a confusing situation simply because the bedding and the nest box uh, materials are the same. I like the design of the nest box here. This one actually has a, a 
uh, a, a roost uh, that's far enough away to where the nest boxes are not going to get fouled. But I'd like to see a different material in here used um, to uh, bed the uh, nest boxes. Perching also allows you to extend um, the floor capacity of your of your housing. But uh, here again, this is an area where you may have a considerable amount of manure accumulate. And so when you have perches, you need to make sure that you keep the material underneath the perches uh, fresh enough to absorb uh, all the droppings that will be deposited as the birds roost. So those are areas that you may want to consider a, a portable roost area or a roost that you can fold up uh, so that you can have ease of uh, cleaning underneath those areas. So when we think about uh, disposal of manure embedding in a small flock situation, one of the first things I always re remind folks is to check your ordinances because there might be restrictions on what you can do. Um, in some cases, you may be able, especially with small flocks, you may be able to take all your manure out of the house, put it in a trash bag, and then put it in your in your garbage collection. Um, I would recommend um, approved you know approved containers for the type of of uh, system or or trash removal that you have. And double bag your manure so that uh, there's no chance uh, that will that the bags will rip open as they're being handled. Do not overload because in most um, most garbage collection uh, services have a weight limit. In my neighborhood, it's 30 pounds, and so they don't want more than 30 pounds in a single trash bag. And the other part of it too is do not allow. Uh, manure to sit in trash containers for any long period of time, simply because what happens is, is that this manure will lose its moisture and harden, creating a, a basically a hockey puck in the bottom of your trash containers that makes it very hard to empty. So if you're going to use this method of disposing of uh, manure off your property, I re fully recommend using trash bags uh, and then depositing them in the trash con uh, container so it makes it easy for removal by your sanitary collection system. So one of the ways of reducing uh, manure buildup on your farm is what I would call a daisy chain or a paddock rotation system. This is nothing new. This is something that was done uh, way back in the 20s uh, to help prevent diseases in turkeys. And I wanna remind everyone that this is a simple way of uh, rotating your ranges around your housing so that it gives the ground a chance to dry up the manure around there. So it can take a higher manure load than if you concentrated the birds all in one spot. And so what you would do is you would have a central house that would have door openings or at least a alleyway system to where you can move the birds to any of, of four paddocks that would have the open areas there for scratching and for walking around. And so what we typically would see, especially with turkeys in season, raising them for Thanksgiving, uh, they would put them in uh, the first paddock for the first day Second day would be the number two, third day would be number three, fourth day number four, and they would just keep ro uh, rotating that uh, around. And so it would be several days before you would see the birds coming back into the first paddock. By doing this, this allows you a chance to let the ground recover from the manure that's being deposited. And if, you know, with a small flock, you can do this very easily uh, with, uh, with chicken wire and framing uh, to move them from place to place to place. You can also use fencing. Uh, electric fencing uh, has been used uh, for paddocks as well with, uh, with uh, pasture-raised birds. So composting <clears throat> is a method of mixing materials together so that we boost the um, thermophilic bacteria. These are bacteria that uh, like heat. And in their uh, growth area, they consume nitrogen. 
and, and other uh, organic materials as they proliferate. They get it to a certain temperature, and then afterwards, uh, once they run out of substrate, they die off, leaving what you see here in the bottom. It looks like coffee grounds, but it's actually what we would call humus. And so um, anyone can create uh, a uh, compost pile very easily, and you can put in there uh, the organic matters, which cons is cons consisting of the feces, the urine, the bedding, uh, any spilled feed from the birds. And then you could also add you know, soil, water, and micronutrients, microorganisms to that mix. Water and heat come off of the pile, as well as ammonia, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. As that goes through that heat cycle, and then you end up with a finished compost, uh, which is full of uh, of organic matter, mineral, and microorganisms that work very well in a garden situation. And so uh, just to demonstrate what can be done, uh, here is a, a photo from the Cornell Waste Management Institute uh, composting school that I attended. And we actually have butchery waste here. This is cattle uh, butcher waste that we put into an organized compost pile and within two months, this material would be unrecognizable from the rest of the material you see here. So air comes in underneath the pile, the bacteria uh, that's surrounding this material starts to consume the, the meat and bone product here, leaving you with humus that can be spread out on the field uh, safely. So doing this on a small scale, can be done very easily if it's organized. And so uh, there are different types of vessels that we can use to compost in. One of the easiest ones is a welded wire loop uh, that would have, you can have uh, chicken wire as a secondary um, wall unit there. And so you can make a circle. And then as you can see here, here's the layers of material, the manure, and other composting materials such as straw, um, clippings, uh, tree clippings, other things like that that can be thrown in there to hasten the composting cycle. Here's another one, uh, a chicken wire uh, stave uh, vessel that has chicken wire with the uh, stakes or staves that are used to hold the shape of the, um, of the composter. You can use uh, snow fencing, for example, that would work the same way. Um, silt fencing would work. Just about anything you can imagine um, would hold that together. A, a pallet system, for example, uh, would work as well uh, as a vessel. So what does this do? Well, this holds its shape so that air can come in underneath the pile up through the pile, and then this thermophilic bacteria starts to reduce all the organic matter that you put into it to help compost. And so when we think about this recipe, we're actually mixing green, what we call green materials and brown materials. So I could have, for example, dropped leaves. I could have um, uh, tree clippings that are green. I could have manure that would be considered green. And I would throw that together and layer it to where the air can come in through the pile, it hits that manure, it starts to compost and it consumes everything around it as it's being composted. And you'll actually see that whole pile of material drop as it's being consumed. And then the, the other part of it is that we would inter, interject more air into the pile and actually get a second uh, heat cycle through that manure and that uh, compost. So here's another example. I, I, <laughs> I got ahead of myself, but here's a here's a wooden pallet uh, composter. The chicken wire is kind of an important thing because a lot of times with composting, um, we could get uh, varmints getting in there. Uh, dogs like to dig in compost piles. Um, down on the shore of Maryland, we have a problem with turkey vultures, black vultures, uh, getting in there and and digging through compost piles, looking for things to eat. 
And so having an organized vessel to put uh, compost in and to keep varmints out is a, is a good design. So this is a uh, more defined bin. Uh, I call this the uh, log cabin arrangement where you have notched staves here uh, that interlock, uh, kind of the Jenga idea. This is kind of a neat idea in the fact that you can build this up as you're loading the uh, compost bin. And you can see how the air can flow through the compost bin to aid in the development of um, bacterial growth within the composter. So very nice designs here. Both of these work very, very well uh, because air can get in from all four sides. This is something I have at home. Uh, this is, uh, I call it the Darth Vader composter. Uh, same, similar idea, you can see that there's holes in the sides of this black drum and it has no floor to it. It, it hits, it sits directly on the, um, on the ground. There's augers here on the sides that help pin this to the ground. And then this top, which is vented, uh, I'm able to put in leaves, um, gar uh, uh, kitchen garbage into it and other uh, brown and green things. I could throw manure in here, for example. And then after a while, this would uh, decompose and compost down to where I could open up this door and pull out um, this uh, mulch or, or compost uh, humus uh, as the final product from this type of composting system. There are drum composters, for example, that do the same thing where you would rotate the drum to help stir it. And this helps add air to it. There is a capacity for these things, uh, these types of composters. Any one of the composters that we have seen so far do have a limit to how much they can hold. But the nice thing about this is that we can multiply these things. We could have two or three or four of these things lined up so that you would always have composting space as you need it uh, as the flock uh, progresses in age. One of the things I was going to say, though, is that you always want to locate your composters and your composting piles away from water uh, impacts or, thing, or water sources. So this would be 200 feet away from a river or stream, 200 feet away from a pond, 200 feet away from a wellhead. Because uh, anything that drops within the close proximity of any of these things could be a possible contaminant to the water supply. So you don't really want to locate anything that's going to drain into a waterway. So the nice thing about composting is that there, there's several different ways of approaching this. The main thing is to think about particle size using coarse materials, uh, especially at the bottom of the pile. This allows air to come up underneath the pile and move through the entire mound of composting. You would mix in uh, carbon and other wastes into the manure to help add aeration and, and what we call tilth to it. And then we use turning to add air to the pile to help get second and third cycles of growth of the bacteria within the pile to help reduce and consume uh, the manure and other things in there. So you can see this is almost finished compost here and a straw cap is put on top of the pile to help keep water from getting too far, you know, infiltrating these piles. And so uh, here's a good example of brown and green resources. I'm not a big fan of, of um, of grass clipping simply because they tend to clump together and they form what I call a jello layer in a compost pile. So typically I don't like using comp, uh, uh, grass clippings as a composting media. I'd rather go for something like this. These are tree clippings and, and shre uh, shredded uh, trimmings off of uh, woody waste that might be around your, your area. Uh, certainly mulch could be used as well because it has a particle size that's a little bit bigger than that of grass. If you really want to get uh, hardcore about composting, you can go out and buy what we call composting fleece. This is a uh, mound cover 
that actually has a porous structure to it that allows air to move through it, but not water. And so water would shed off of this material and CO2 and O2 can move in and out uh, to the composting pile. And as you can see here, here are uh, professional composters that are um, putting compost fleece over the top of their piles as they're turning them. And uh, you can see here the brown compost that's in process versus the black humus stage of finished compost. And that's what they're driving to. This is a multi-million dollar business. A lot of people are buying compost uh, as topsoil and other uh, plant amendments. Uh, it's used in soilless um, uh, plant mixes and other things and can be used very easily as a uh, manure uh, a fertilizer for around your homes and gardens. So, okay, so how can I tarp my, my composting pile without having to go through six ballet movements? And so one of the things I do is I, I recommend to folks to get a fairly inexpensive tarp. Uh, you can get plastic sheeting from a home um, improvement store anything like that that can be used um, to uh, cover the pile. And then you can use what I call a ball hitch, uh, which is a golf ball, smooth rock, a handful of sand or anything like that, that forms a ball that you can cover with the tarp. And then you snug a rope around that clump that's, that was formed in the tarp. And so you can pull very easily on that tarp and cinch it down to, to a stake without having to create a hole or poke a hole through the tarp itself. So it's very uh, effective in holding a large tarp with a series of these what I call ball hitches. So you can get second chance golf balls, for example, very easily at most, um, I don't know, um, sporting goods stores. Uh, they're very cheap to, to find or you can even use uh, smooth pebbles or anything that's handy around your area that you can use to make these, what I call golf ball uh, hitches uh, to help cover your compost piles. You don't want to introduce too much water to your manure or uh, composting piles simply because where is that water going to go? It gets to where it's saturated and then you have leachate and other things that are coming out of the pile that's gonna create problems for you. And so. Controlling water is an important part of good composting and manure handling. So another, another technique that I use for composting is what I call crimp, uh, corn crib fronts. Uh, these are just basically uh, sl uh, slanted boards in the front of our composting bin that allows you to slide boards as the composter is being built up. And so you can hold a lot of manure, uh, you can hold uh, a lot of compost in a situation like this very easily without taking up too much room by, by making sure that your bin is filled front to back, side to side, rather than just a sloping hill within your composter. So using a, um, a easily used uh, door system these doors slide in on an angle, and so you're only moving them two to three inches to get them in and out, instead of doing what I call the guillotine type of door, where the uh, board goes from the top to the bottom of the composter, and you have to slide it from the bottom to the top to get it out. Uh, that makes it kind of hard to do under a load. So these are very easily done, uh, moved in and out. You wouldn't believe it, but there's actually hogs being composted inside of this composting bin. And uh, if it's done right, you wouldn't even know it is there. So a close up of this type of composter, you can see that there are two boards here uh, that allow airflow to move between the bins. This is important. You want airflow all the way around your composting area, uh, all the way around your manure pile so that you can get enough air in there to promote thermophilic bacteria to grow and to help digest part of the material that's in the pile. That's important because what you're doing is you're reducing bulk and you're taking that, that 
uh, raw manure and curing it down to a material that you can spread onto your fields, onto your lawns, into your gardens that won't overpower the plants that you have there. Another way of looking at it is by monitoring the composting process by measuring the temperature of the compost pile. There are composting thermometers that have like two to three foot long stems that allow you to push into the compost pile. And so you're looking for a compost temperature that's gonna range between 110 to 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And seeing a drop in temperature will actually tell us when it is time to turn. As you get a drop in temperature that you're down below 100 degrees, it's time to turn the pile, get more air in there, and then you'll actually see another blossom or another heat cycle uh, as the bacteria take off again, because they got oxygen into the system. So you're using air uh, to help boost comp uh, decomposition within the manure pile. And so I would suggest turning by temp rather than by time. Uh, and you would turn every full bin at least once to ensure that all the materials in your compost pile is digesting. So you would add manure, maybe a layer of straw, another layer of manure, another layer of straw. If you're composting birds, uh, dead birds that may die as you go, you would throw the dead bird in the middle of all that. And uh, making sure that those dead birds are in the middle of the pile, not along the edge of the pile. But even with a, um, this is a three-sided pallet type composter, you can see this double wall feature here that is in the wall structure here that allows air to move in between the two cells, getting air through that compost. And that's an important part of it. And so using a, um, a silage fork or a muck rake, uh, you can move a lot of material very quickly, very easily moving it from, from one side to the other as you want to, uh, to get air into that compost pile to get it to digest. So that is a brief overview of composting and manure handling on a uh, small um, stage. And um, if you have further questions about this or have issues with your composting and you need to diagnose it a little bit, uh, feel free to contact me, my email's here. And you can follow me on the social media below here. So with that, Jackie, I think I'll take your questions. Okay, the first question was related to the um, putting of the manure into the trash. Um, Josephine asked, why are you throwing away manure instead of composting? Good question. Some people don't have enough places to go with their manure. And so they may have excess manure. They don't know what to do with it. So there's two ways of getting going th that way. One is to throw it away. The other is to check with your neighbors, see if they need manure for their gardens or, or their uh, fields or uh, lawns. So check but you manure. you don't want to put fresh manure on anything. No, you don't want to put raw manure on any plants because what you're going to do is what we call burn. You'll get a nitrogen burn and it'll turn your lawn yellow. And so composted material is always the best. So the NPK, I forgot to mention that, the NPK on composted poultry manure is usually two, two, and two by weight. Okay. Uh, Josephine, uh, we have been using an enzyme product called Healthy Pen on the litter in the pens. It's supposed to start the composting process. Do you have an opinion about using enzymes with the birds? Uh, no, not necessarily, simply because it's going to get mixed up within the strata of the manure itself. The only thing that you're losing is, is uh, depth to your composting. So I would think that maybe you may want to save that inoculant for when you move the manure out and put it into an organized composting pad or, or bin, and then sprinkle that material on the manure as you're building the layers up and then let it compost that way. That way it won't get stirred up. It'll allow the enzymes to work on the manure. And I think you'll get a better outcome. Sounds good. 
Uh, Lauren asks, with the taller compost bins, how does one get the litter into that without wearing it? <laughs> okay, so the tall bins, yeah, the, those were those are about uh, four to six feet tall. With a corn crib front, you're basically putting them in as you're building. So it starts out at six inches, which most people can throw into, and then you build them up. And then there was a picture of the log cabin uh, board unit. You would build those boards up as you were filling the compost bin. So if you are of short stature, your bins could be adjusted to the height that you need in order to throw material into them. So I married a person who is only about five foot tall. So I'm six two. And so I understand um, height challenging uh, activities. Right. Uh, Josephine asks, we have been told that a dry anaerobic environment is a good way to compost our litter piles, which are roughly equivalent to 20 bales of pine shavings. We currently have a pile which has been aging about two months already. To keep it dry, we keep it covered with a tarp. The current plan is to allow it to continue to compost until March. Do you have an opinion of this type of system? Yeah, I, I think you may want to check it, to, uh, dig into it every now and then, pull the tarp back, dig into it and monitor the, the composting process. You may have to fluff it up to add air into it to help get that to compost a little bit quicker for you. Uh, but certainly, uh, it sounds like you have the right idea. She's in Jacksonville, North Carolina, I think. Yeah, which gets a lot of rain. So yeah, you need to cover in order to keep it uh, from getting too wet. The other part of it, too, is that you want to make sure you're mixing the manure with the, with the pine shavings because pine has uh, pine oil in it, and it's a natural an uh, antimicrobial. And so you're going to depress all that uh, thermophilic bacteria just from the pine oil. So it's going to be a little bit slower than say wood chips and other materials that don't have that oil in it. But uh, certainly you will be able to get to, I think, a finished compost fairly easily uh, with fluffing it up every now and then to get air into the pile. Yeah. Um... Jay says that they have five birds in Arizona. Too much moisture is rarely a problem and summer temperatures do reach 110 degrees. Yeah. Are there any other considerations with uh, composting in a very dry climate? Uh, yeah, because you know where you're at, you're getting maybe six to nine inches of rain a year. Uh, where I'm at, I'm getting 35. Uh, it's either feast or famine. So I, I do feel for you out there on the, on the desert. So in some cases, especially when we're composting, sometimes we have to actually add water to the compost. It sounds counterintuitive, but yes, if the, if the compost is too dry, the bacteria will not survive. It gets too desiccated and they die off. And so you have a static pile of whatever you just threw in there. And so every now and then, you need to do what I call a moisture test. You, you grab the material in your hands and you feel it. It should feel just slightly damp or a little bit less than that okay so it's it's a judgment call but we actually especially with larger birds when we're composting large mortalities we actually dunk these birds in water before we add them to the compost pile just to add water so that there's microbiological activity right at that interface and so uh, wet manure will help with the composting uh, in a dry situation, but you may have to water the pile periodically through to make sure it composts all the way through. We're not talking a lot. We're just talking a little bit just to keep it damp, uh, to keep it active. And they can monitor that with the temperature, right? Temperature as well as the what I call the field test. Yeah. You don't want to you don't want to squeeze it and see water come out of that but you want to have it to where it's almost like damp, um, like, like damp leaves. Well, where would you sample that to do the squeeze test? Cause you've got the inside of it and then you got the outside edges. I would make a, a what I call a kitty hole where you would dig a hole and reach in there and, and look at it that way and then cover it back up. Okay. Yeah. Cause the cap's going to be absolutely bone dry. 
The core is going to be the working part of it. And that's why we turn, because what we're going to do is we're going to take that cap, we're going to throw it into the middle of the pile, and now that cap has a chance to, to compost as well. Can you put raw waste bedding on fallow garden plots? Yes, but, and here's the but, then it's open to uh, other things getting to it, like flies and other vermin. And so you probably need to either incorporate it into your, um, into your ground or you need to compost it because compost can sit on the ground without it being a problem. Uh, raw materials sitting on the ground uh, is inviting uh, other pests to come in. Yeah, just ask anyone who's lived next to a farm that has spread raw manure <laughs> Without yeah, and then and then what happens? Incorporating the, it. Yeah, the dog goes out there and rolls in the manure and comes home and says, "Hi, mom," you know, and <laughs> covered in manure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got the questions that uh, were emailed. So uh, she has uh, ten laying hens. Their poop deck is sand, and I use a kitty litter scooper to clean up and dump it into a Homer bucket with a lid. One for each month where it can age. One per month. So I know how old it is. There is some residual sand on the scooped stuff. I do have a tumbler composter, which I would rather not add chicken poop, nor do I want a manure pile. Question number one, should I add air holes, I assume to the buckets, maybe along the top edge of the Homer bucket so it won't get wet from rain, but can still airflow and will a sealed bucket work? Seal bucket wouldn't work because it's going to sweat and uh, you're going to get a lot of moisture in there. Uh, so yeah, drilling uh, like uh, three eighths inch holes in the in the sides there might be a good alternative. You can also take those buckets and leave them open, but put maybe a plastic corrugated uh, roofing material over the top so that you can have airflow over the tops of the buckets without water getting into the bucket. Okay, question two. How long before I add to vegetable raised beds or since it's fall and live in the northeast, frost is coming this week, and nothing will be planted until May, can I add fresh raw manure now? Uh, yeah. No, nah, I, would, I would suggest you compost it and then go ahead and add it to your garden. Even in the middle of winter, you can add the compost to it. But use your composting bin as your holding um, material, simply because uh, you're going to lose a lot of nitrogen to the air. And so if you spread it too soon, then you're losing that nitrogen. So I would, I would say go ahead and compost it and leave it in the compost pile as a holding place. And then a few weeks, like three weeks before you're going to dig up your garden, go ahead and spread it work in the soil, get your, your beds ready, let them go through what we call the sweat, and then you should be okay. Are they actually composting if they're not adding any um, carbon? Because it, it sounds like all she does is put the manure in there to age. No, you need, you need a carbon, you need a carbon source. So this is where the uh, tree trimmings and other things would be helpful um to, to go into that the red the, yeah yeah what we call the green and the browns yeah you need to have something else put in there yeah. so that's where the mulch comes into play that's where your tree trimmings if you have a tree trimmer in your area a lot of times they're looking for places to dump their materials and so you know a small pickup bed of uh of trimmings from a tree trimmer might be just the thing to have off to the side that you can use to add into your composting materials. Yeah, because they're if they're just putting the manure in there, they're not they're just aging it. They're not composting. They're just aging manure and it's not composting. No, not at all. Not enough air moving through it. No. Her last question was how much age composted chicken gold per pan, per bed, a three by seven bed by weight or inches. That would depend on what your soil is, right? Yeah, and you can always test it. Uh, take it, take a sample. Um, a, a, go to your uh, local extension office and see if they have test kits for manure, and you can actually take a sample of that manure of that com finished compost 
and see what the MPK values are by weight. And that way, you know, for every pound you're adding to the garden, you're adding this much nitrogen, this much potassium, this much phosphorus. So, yeah. And you can get your soil analyzed as well. So to as see well. You, so you know how much what you need. See what you need to put on there. Yes. Okay, good. Um, we have about 10 more minutes if people have more questions. Um, I'm not seeing any more in the um, Q&A and I'm not seeing any in the chat. So uh, while you're thinking about it, I'll just let you know that next month is uh, December 7th. And I think December 7th, whatever Tuesday is. Tuesday, yeah. And we have a chef coming. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, webinars on alternative poultry meats with the duck, the guinea fowl, the quail. Um, so um, Chef Perry is going to talk about cooking with uh, alternative poultry meats. So it should be an interesting um, presentation uh, just in time for Christmas in case you want to do something special for Christmas. You can try an alternative. I've um, roasted, I've roasted ducks. I've roasted geese. Uh, I've had pheasants, uh, ostrich, quail. It all tastes great. It depends on how you cook them and what you put on them. Yeah. So don't be afraid. Uh, question. What color is healthy chicken manure? So it should look, it depends on what uh, the short answer is. It depends on what the birds were eating because they'll, they'll void uh, a wetter version of what they're eating. And so if they have a high corn content, it might be yellow in, in uh, color. color. And then it may go towards a woody brown. If you see black or tar uh, consistency droppings, that's usually... Uh, a lot of sequel voiding going on, and uh, it's usually indicative of something going on with your birds that you need someone to look at. And if they're on pasture, they, it would be greener, right? Greener, correct. Although brilliant uh, chartreuse green and very mucoid or very sticky jello-like, that's usually an, an issue too. Yeah, you want to be There should be a white... Solid. Yeah, and there should be a white cap to each of the droppings that they drop because they get rid of their uh, urine at the same time they get rid of their manure. So it's usually a two-phased color thing. You'll have the, the brown of the solids and the white cap of the urine part that's pushed out. Yeah, the uric acid. Yep. Okay, any last-minute questions? This uh, was recorded. Recording will go up uh later tonight or early tomorrow uh which will be available on our youtube channel um it will also be linked in from the page that i posted before with the uh, poultryextension.org um to under uh past webinars oh we got another one i'm using lime to help dry out my pen is this going to change how i can compost my manure it's going to change basically the pH of the of the material that's there. But usually, if you add enough um, uh, chips or or carbon to the to the mix, it shouldn't overrun it too much. I think uh, we use limestone, for example, as a as a soil amendment, and so using uh, lime and you know don't overdo the lime. Um, just a little bit of lime would, would help uh, for that. Uh, remember, lime can be a very um, astringent uh, chemical on poultry feet, so you can get cracking in the feet if you're not careful, so don't overdo the lime. Okay. Any more questions? This is kind of why I use, like the idea of, of range rotation. So you don't get into the situation where you have these soppy, wet uh, poultry runs. If you have room to do that, I would suggest at least two or more runs to where you can have one run just sitting empty and drying. It helps for disease control. It helps for a lot of different things. Parasites. By having, yeah, by having this rotational program. Oh, okay. Another question. We had so much rain at once that everything was wet. 
<laughs> that was the person using the line. Yeah, well, Lauren, uh, and, and that sometimes happens. And so one of the ways of helping to dry your pile is, is uh, turning it over, over and over and over to help add air to it, to help drain it uh, and moving it around. So, and you can also add dry materials into it, uh, more chips, more carbon, just to help dry it up and then cover. Uh, you know, tarps are so inexpensive these days. Everybody should have six. Uh, I keep a few at home and I don't even have birds. So uh, I use it for a lot of different things. Okay, well, thank you very much, Greg. You did a great job as usual. Thank um, you. Very much appreciated. I hope everybody has a, had a good Halloween and is looking forward to a great Thanksgiving. So, yes. um, and, again, and you know, for those who are raising turkeys this year, we thank you for your participation. Make sure you eat your weight in turkey. Make a turkey uh, farmer happy. <laughs> <laughs> Go turkeys. Yeah. Yeah. Someone okay. asked me about uh, turkey production in Pennsylvania, and we produce 6.7 million turkeys in uh, Pennsylvania alone, and we're not even in the top 10. Well, they, they've been talking about turkey shortages. Are we going to have a turkey shortage this year? I, I don't think so because of what we have in frozen storage. Uh, I think for local producers that might be producing birds on their own farms, yes, there might be a shortage simply because they didn't put enough pulse down for the demand that they have. So yes, uh, spot shortages, yes. Overall shortages, I don't think so. I think no. we'll still see even lots of, uh, lots of turkeys there and the loss and the idea of a chain store using turkeys as a what we call a loss leader to get you into the store. If you buy $200 worth of groceries, we'll give you a free turkey. Well, I'll, you know, we'll trade money all day long that way. <laughs> yeah. He's good. yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you guys for attending. And I hope to see you next month. I'm still working on putting together next year's um, program. I'm having a little trouble with our service provider. So uh, we'll get that sorted out and get those up soon. So Everybody have a good evening. Take care. Bye, bye Greg. Great bye. job, as usual. See you later this month. Yeah. <laughs>